Oh, y'all yeah, really? Okay. Let's do it. Um, <clears throat> um, so, first on inherency, there is significant lack of national data on use of force by a police officer. This is KD15. Getting reliable data on the fatal police encounters in the United States is notoriously difficult. The FBI has struggled to gather the most basic data, relying on local police departments to voluntarily share information about officer-involved shootings. Since 2011, less than 3% of the nation's 18,000 state and local police agencies have done so. That's the plan. The United States federal government will substantially increase the regulation of state and or local police misconduct in the United States by passing the Pride Act. Solvency. Use of force data improves measures of accountability and transparency. This is Castro 17. In Texas and other states across the nation, clashes between civilians and officers have led to strained community and law enforcement relations. More information as collected about these incidents is the better equipped will be to prevent them from happening again in the future. Uniform through transparent records on use of force and by police, by and against police officers will inform policy making and improve public safety. The better we understand the circumstances surrounding these violent incidences, the better, the more effective we'll be in healing our communities and saving lives. The Pride Act requires that instant reports to the Department of Justice. We cannot, uh, we cannot address challenges to protecting public safety and ensuring justice by getting reliable data. Data on use of force incidences between law enforcement and civilians is badly incomplete, making it difficult to seek solutions driven by facts. This bill will improve the measures of accountability and transparency in reporting use of force incidences and provide much needed information that will help shape policies to better protect both police and the public because both of our communities and law enforcement will benefit from greater transparency and accountability. And the Pride Act is a central part of the strategy to keep our communities and officers safe. On to solvency number two. Statistical data is effective at establishing causation. This is Spiderman, Mather, and Miles 07. Statistics can be used not only to prove that the city had a policy of failing to supervise and discipline its officers, but also to establish causation. Officers were encouraged in their belief that they can abuse African Americans with impunity because the city system of reviewing complaints against officers was so defective. The first advantage is racial violence. The unique point is this. Lack of reporting, a lack of reporting incidents leads to inaccurate data about how many people are killed and injured by police nationally. This is Gruber and Schmidt 15. The data discrepancy has brought to light the U.S. government's inability to track how many people kill or injure. The law is not effective because reporting is optional as opposed to mandatory reporting by the police. None of these agencies are required to report to the public or the Justice Department anything about police officer shootings, let alone their use of less lethal force. Now, the link. This underreported use of force disproportionately affects people of color. This is ACLU 17. Now, how common is police brutality? Unfortunately, measuring the problem in a scientific fashion has always been very difficult. In the first systemic study, Rice found that the overall rate of use of force to be low, but individual incidences accumulate over time, and poor men are most frequent victims of police abuse. In a police services study, only 30% of, of, uh, of the people file formal complaints. In other words, most instances of police abuse go unreported. A low overall rate masks the high rate of abuse suffered by poor men, poor men of color in particular. Internal link. Masking of racially based violence is rooted and increases structural violence. This is Ragland 14. Disproportionality in police use of force against black Americans persists and cannot be tolerated. The kills of black Americans by law enforcement, security guards, and stand your ground vigilantes have increased to one to twenty uh, one to every twenty eight hours. This appalling statistic is rooted in structural race and that systemically excludes persons of color from opportunities and perpetuates negative stereotypes. The black community is often framed as animal and vi uh, violent and animalistic. Perspectives like these serve to perpetuate structural racism and justify violence against the black community as people who. Should should be feared. With increasingly militarized police departments across the U.S., the supported and influenced by a government that uses violence to humanize the world, our city streets are battlegrounds. With structural racism harmful to humanize the images, the enemy insurgents are black. Black men are predetermined as a super predator and sentenced to the death for the safety and security of American society. This is Curry 14. The black male is not born a patriarchal male. He is race and sex peculiarly configured as barbaric and savage, imagined to be a violent animal, not a human being. The spirit of black males allows society to support the imposition of death upon these bodies and consent to the rationalization of police they offer as their justification for killing the black male beast, the rapist, the criminal, the deadly thug, the need to destroy the black beast couple before matures into full pathology. The black boy sends a potential nigga beast. This anti-black dynamic affects the black boy's new kind of racism built upon the anti-black 
mythology of America's black males as a super predator. This acts legitimizes the violence responsible for black males, but it inculcates a rationalization given what black males actually are because black males dying and death is a necessary and indispensable part of American society. Even childhood cannot protect young black boys from society. Cut the card and society. Now let's go on to the framework. Now, the 1SC challenges institutional racism, which is a prior ethical question because racism makes violence structurally inevitable, causes domination, dehumanization, and exclusion. This is Hudson Weems, 97. We need theories for our own survival. We ask if the theories that we embrace work for our unique experiences in this racially hostile world. We do not have the luxury of spending time on external nuances, sacrificing internal nuances, thus our own critical theories for analyzing our own critical experiences are needed for black thought, for housing, and decimating our life experiences. Cross -ex. <clears throat> Is funding and enforcement normal means? Yes. Okay, and what are those normal means? So the normal means is basically listed out in a heresy that talks about this bill based called the Pride Act. Mm -hmm. It's been in Congress for a little bit right now. So basically what that means is once the bill gets passed, then we already have funding within the status quo as it is. And what's your enforcement mechanism there. for this plan action? So basically the Pride Act is actually a uh, provided by grants that are given to basically cities that are, if they do this, then they will get some sort of financial incentive. So it's at the city but, level? It's at the city level. It's at the federal government being passed down to the state, which is being passed down through the local government. Right, right, but are the grants that are being used in order to enforce a plan action to the city or to the state? It's to, uh, could you clarify your question a little bit? I'm sorry. Yeah, so these grants, so I'm guessing you're talking about like the Edward Memorial uh, Giant Grant. Mm -hmm. So are they being cut off to the state level or to the city individually? To the precincts or to the state, which then distributes it to the cities? Well, it goes down to the state, which distributes this to the cities. Basically, it's like a incentivization program if you participate in this program, which a lot of police departments will be able to do and will do because they don't want to be seen as racist in you know, their cities. They'll be incentivized for their purposes. Okay, for sure. So, right now, you say that the current use of force data um, attempts are not enough. So, what do these consist of? So basically in the status quo, or not a status quo, but actually there has been a FBI program that has tried to do this based on Has there only been one FBI program? Well, if I finish my statement, thank you. Um, that information essentially has provided the FBI with uh, little to no information at all, but thus by making this available to 18,000 local and state police departments across the United States, police departments will have that incentive not only on a financial scale, but on an ethical scale, which the Curry 14 car goes into a lot of talks about talking about how we see black people and how we can actually begin to form and change that mindset. So has there only people. been one FBI collection attempt? Yes. So to my knowledge. Is. Okay. So from the very beginning there's only been one. To my knowledge. Is. All right. And so how did that go? What was the enforcement mechanism for that one? Um, so from that one, I, I believe it was the same thing of the grant program, but you see the difference between the FBI and the United States federal government doing it is not a particular branch or particular section. It's actually being a law that's being mandated that's being passed as opposed to the FBI is doing this on their whim. So the difference between the FBI and the United States federal government is that you have an enforcement mechanism that's Who's going to be creating the grants post plan? The Justice Department, like it's being stated out within my app. So the Justice Department specifically with Jeff Sessions, and what incentive would he have? So Jeff Sessions is seen as bluntly as I could put it as a racist toward in terms of like how he treats black people and about how Coretta Scott King actually a couple years ago actually petitioned for him not to be on the federal court. And in lieu of the things that are going on right now, it'll be in Jeff Sessions' best interest in order for him to start these programs because you know you don't want to be seen as a racist in the United States. So
pretty good. Mm -hmm. All right. Starting off with the topicality, it's going to be the interpretation. Increases to become or to make something greater in amount, number, value. Oxford Bloomberg Dictionary. Speaking of violation, a national use of force data collection agency has already been established in the status quo. Therefore, they are not increasing regulation. Fallen in 16. The Obama administration has announced details of an ambitious set of plans to collect comprehensive national data on fatal police encounters and non-lethal use of force incidents and FBI in 17. December 3, 2015, the APB approved a series of motions to establish a new data collection on law enforcement use of force. On February 9, 2016, the FBI director signed the APB recommendation. January 27, 2016, the National Use of Force Collection Task Force comprised of law enforcement leaders from across the United States convened for the first time in a series of meetings. Little item is going to be that the FBI Use of Force Data Collection Database covers all of the areas supposedly unique to the AF, FBI in 17. The Use of Force Data Collection will include subjects' information, age, sex, race, ethnicity, height, and weight. Season will be extended. It's risk without predictability. The resolution is the key to predictability. Violating the resolution in any way steals all predictability that the resolution creates for negative teams. An affirmative case is supposed to take action to solve problems that aren't already being actively worked on in the status quo, allowing the affirmative their interpretation creates a world with an infinite number of affirmative based on actions that are already being played out and already starting to garner solvency. Two is going to be ground. Our interpretation creates fair grounds for both teams because it forces the affirmative to affirm the resolution. When you allow the affirmative to take action uh, that the status quo is already taken, it steals negative ground, creating an unfair advantage for the affirmative. These are going to be the voters. First, going to be that of stock issues. Topicality and inherency are stock issues that the affirmative must meet. At the point where they are not inherent, you have to judge to vote them down for failing to meet their burden. Two is going to be education. We learn nothing from around where we must debate redundant actions where the harms and benefits have already played out. This is a history class. This is a round where future policymakers try to understand the impacts of their current actions would have on the world, not analysis of what past actions have done. There is going to be fairness. Vote negative to advocate for fairness within not only this round, but in future rounds to follow. Nobody wants to play a game that is inherently unfair. In order to avoid the class of debate, you must create a space in which every debate is a fair game. E is going to be the framework. Point one is going to be that framework of competing interpretations. This position should be valid on whichever interpretation is better as judged by the standards. Two is going to be a priori. You should be evaluating this sheet before anything else in the debate because we must decide on the rules of the game before we're able to play it. Next to the disadvantage, one, Federal rulings prevent the Trump administration from enforcing local police compliance on immigration. Time in 17. A federal judge denied the request by the DOJ to lift the national freeze on Trump policy that would withhold public safety grants to sanctuary cities that don't agree to tougher enforcement of U.S. immigration law. Jeff Sessions argued it was wrong to apply an order nationally in a case brought by Chicago and that it should apply only to that city. Line worker agreed that his rule, written ruling that such a sweeping freeze was extraordinary, that a U.S. district judge shouldn't resort to lightly, but he said the legal issues in the Chicago case impact cities and counties nationwide into a nationwide injunction. It is called for, cut the card there too. The plan provides a statutory mechanism for sessions to create federal mandates for local police. He would use that to force compliance with federal immigration enforcement, no one 17. The Justice Department 2018 budget seeks to update a portion of federal law which bans local governments from enacting policies that restrict or prohibit communication with federal immigration authorities. The proposed change would require law enforcement to comply with federal immigration requests that it may be held in custody to give federal immigration authorities time to retrieve them. The Justice Department and Homeland Security Secretary are seeking to change to a prevention of state and local government government officials from prohibiting or restricting any government and steer official from complying with a civil immigration detainer request. The changes would also ban local law enforcement from adopting policies that ban increase by nationality, citizenship, and immigration. Uh, status in an ongoing lawsuit brought by San Francisco, the Justice Department in April ordered that the only three DOJ grants could be revoked under the executive order. Under the budget proposal, all Justice Departments and Homeland Security Department grants would be at risk if jurisdiction failed to comply with the new expanded version of Section 1373. The plan is to use the federal budget to radically change the statute in order to put saber tooth requirements into law. If approved, it would impose much harsher mandates on jurisdictions and turn each of them into holding pens for Trump's deportation force. The reason to be that state and local police immigration institutionalizes racism and racial profiling, Proven in 15. The role that race plays in federal immigration enforcement operation under a federal policy of devolution, local law enforcement agencies are being asked to assist in enforcing federal immigration law. The mix of federal, state, and local law and policy institutionalizes racism by facilitating ethno-racial profiling, hyper-surveillance, and abusive stops, problematic searches, and unwarranted detentions. The target of these actions are disproportionately Latinos because U.S. Americans, including members of the law enforcement community, have been conditioned to see a problem of unauthorized entry in residential and racial terms. So under view, essentially what's happening is that the Department of Justice using the very same enforcement mechanism that the affirmative is trying to use to force the local police to enforce immigration law. Now this was blocked by a judge. Their enforcement mechanism is illegal and unconstitutional right now in the status quo. Now this is going to be a double bind. Either one, it gets struck down, which means that the affirmative case has zero solvency, or two, it creates a precedence that then also gives the Department of Justice and Donald Trump the ability to force state and local police to enforce immigration law. Next is going to be that on the program 15 evidence on how this institutionalizes racism. This also blockades them from accessing their many 2K framing evidence on institutionalized racism and their impact. This is going to be a direct turn onto case. Let's go ahead and get on to case. On inherency, 
The national use of force data collection agency has already been established in the status quo, therefore this case has no inherency. Cross apply the law in 16 and the FBI in 17 evidence. They're going to try to make the argument that this is the very same instance that they're talking about in their inherency. But no, check the date. This is from 2015. This is the DRCA program that was then rescinded because they realized, hey, this doesn't work. And then in 2016, the FBI created a new program that functions on the very same grant system and tried to do that. And at the end of the day, the fact that we still have these harms means that they cannot solve on solvency. First, it means that the federal government lacks the authority to force state and local law enforcement to comply. Scotus in 97. Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce a federal regulatory program. Congress cannot circumvent the prohibition by conscripting the state's officers directly. The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems nor command the state's officers directly. This forced the federal government to create the grants in a lot of terms for compliance per their own um, solvency mechanism. Next, it that this plan gives Jeff Sessions the ability to create these grants. Congress in 15. Be it enacted by the State and House of Representatives of the United States of America, the Congress uh, assembled the Pride Act, authorized the Attorney General to make grants to eligible states and Indian tribes to be used for the activities desired in subsection C. We make the argument that Sessions won't follow through the plan. He's hostile to federal reform and swamps it with delays. Read in 17. Sessions reviews all dealings with local law enforcement. Sessions has been critical of consent decrees and practice to reform police. The Baltimore case will be delayed. In Chicago, Sessions has not committed to following through with reform. Sessions has long been critical of federally enforced reforms. This is going to be terminal no solvents that towards their enforcement mechanism in and of itself says that they don't want to do this. They do not get access to fiat this, which means that the plan is probably going to get rolled back and it's going to be terminal no solvents for this. On to advantage one. We make the argument that one, specifically referencing this code is in 97 evidence on their uniqueness on how this data isn't going to be able to be collected because it's going to be ruled unconstitutional. On two, we say that it's under a report if we say turn, it's going to be increasing the use of force, specifically referencing how their enforcement mechanism allows the, the federal government to mandate state and local police to enforce immigration law. Next, on the masking argument, their internal link, we say turn, the plan's going to be masking much more than they can't solve. On the super predator plan cannot solve, makes it worse. And then finally, on the framework, they don't flow through at the point that they're simply going to be increasing institutionalized racism. Cross examination. All right. Um, Sorry, Alright. Um, so my first question is how uh, is the FBI agency not. Uh, can you explain to me the difference between national law and basically something that CIA goes and does on their own? So here's the thing. The FBI is an executive agency just like the DOJ. It has the exact same power in terms of forcing state and local uh, compliance in these issues. The FBI is under the DOJ, which means that, well, it's the exact same enforcement. Now the key system. question to that, was that a law that was passed through Congress and made official law, yes or no? Through Congress, I yes. am not familiar with that information. Right so now. the FBI didn't pass any state sanctioned law or nationally sanctioned, uh, sanctioned law that requires for you to be in the uh, to use the national use of force data system. Is so that essentially, correct? your enforcement mechanism is the Department Sorry, of that Justice. Was a yes or no it is the executive branch. Now, the FBI, under the executive branch, has the exact same power regardless of if it was passed by a bill in Congress or not. So that still still doesn't answer my question, but okay. Um, so, can you explain to me the articulation as to how, by simply recording data, that somehow increases structural racism? Because I'm missing the internal link there. So, essentially, right now, the Department of Justice is trying to use the very same enforcement mechanism as their plan to force state and local police to enforce immigration law. The whole grant a, system. A collection system that basically rewards you for just collecting information. The problem isn't arrests. what your system does. It's how it's trying to be forced upon the state and local through police. Through grants? Yeah, through grants. It was ruled to be unconstitutional. But this goes to 97 evidence and the uniqueness point on the disadvantage. Okay, so getting to your SCOTUS 97 argu uh, uh, 97 statement, I'm older, or uh, well, like that argument is now older than I am. So the question is, has the law changed since 1997? No, when you look in terms of the target how? 17 evidence, specifically referencing how the courts have, again, upheld that the Department of Justice cannot compel state and local police to enforce immigration law, even through the use of grants, which is, once again, your mechanism for enforcement. So can you explain to me the second argument that uh, that says that Jeff, Jeff Sessions won't follow through to the plan? Can you give me uh, basically like a summarization of that real quick? Sure. So basically Jeff Sessions doesn't believe that it's the federal government's job to regulate state and local police. One, he's already looked at as a racism, which means, as a racist, which means he doesn't care what his reputation happens to him. Two, also Jeff Sessions is going to be looked at as a hero by his base, not as a racist. 
Um, my last question is, can you explain to me the Ali 16 card? I don't need to know the contents, so I just need, a, just need a summary of what that is. Just a quick summary? Yep. So basically, it doesn't not matter how much evidence is stacked, how much data is reported, these officers are never tried because of the hand and glove relationship that they have with the court system. So like, you, you, if data establishes causality, you know what establishes more causality? Like videotapes of them actually doing the shootings and the killings, and these videotapes are not enough to get them prosecuted, so why would a piece of data, a piece of sheet, paper, do that what a video cannot? Yep. Was it four minutes? Yeah. All right. Pause it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to read something different. <laughs> if you asked, I was like, wait, hold up, never mind, it's going to be too off. This man is lying. Were you too? Well, I wasn't about to spread through like the three off that I usually do. I look forward to one hour disclosure theory. Oh, yeah. Wow. That is amazing. <laughs> Sensational. This is your theory of the PMs that the first speech is the best kind of disclosure theory. One AI. Yeah. Come put it in the first speech. It's a nib. You have used two eight.
go ahead and flash you. Please don't erase it. Um, of getting this to you. The reason why you're going to be started, the reason why you're going to be voting for cases is because we actually propose an actual plan that actually does the most amount of change with the most best amount of people. Now we're going to go ahead and go to the first argument that uh, the first argument that we particularly talks about that the sovereignty mechanism that particularly says about how the use of force data improves measures of accountability and transparency. Now the financial aspect of it is actually not the burden of the question. The actual question here is the amount of ethics that this is going to produce about uh, uh, in the community about number one having communities feel safe about police officers within their community because number one the distinction that I made within process that in the status quo it's only optional because reporting is optional made by the FBI by now when this turns into law and passes into law now governments will be able or the actual state and local police farmers actually have a incentive in order for them to do this program instead of what's happening within the status quo number one the, or number two the second argument is that we still innately solve because this, uh, the, uh, the thing that I talked about uh, at the bottom uh, actually the Craig Fortico that talks about how uh, the bigger structural issues about how black people are seen within the status quo and these are the reasons as to how we are got to the how we get to the status quo and the negative does not do anything to address that. All they say is that the financial plan of it is a bad idea, but they don't get to the structural part about how the mindset that we see about black people, uh, about how black people and people of color in general, about, and about how police sanction violence upon uh, people of color are actually the real root cause, and by actually passing a plan, by passing a product, and about uh, approving measures of accountability and transparency. Not only are we able to uh, effectively do uh, these first argument on sovereignty, which is talking about statistical data, is effective at establishing causation, but also, number two, hold these police officers accountable because last Last time I checked, communities want to be able to know what is going on within their police departments. And also, number three, he says that the, the actually the uh, the plan won't even solve because national use of force data is actually happening within the status quo. Like I now, like I said before, it is from the FBI. The FBI had an optional reporting system that didn't provide any grant system or any incentivized program. And also, that was under the Obama administration when everything was going all nice and dandy. We're in a new administration where we're with new problems that are going on, which means that this isn't actually at the most utmost uh, at the utmost issue about what's going on within the status quo. Also, the argument, that, particularly the argument that talked about the use of date and time and location about the use of uh, use of force reports incidents are, are like actually being happening within the status quo. Nowhere in there does it force immigration officers to. Actually actually go out and actually start targeting and prioritizing uh, uh, undocumented immigrants and also number two doesn't that actually um, doesn't that actually feed into what we're talking about how structural racism plays a role in which it happens on everyday life so that means ultimately at the end of the day the plan is a first step and also number two it's, nece it's a necessity to actually cause a uh, uh, actually cause a dialogue between not only the citizens but also number two the people that are in these communities and don't let him get up here and say about how Jeff Sessions doesn't want because Jeff Sessions is innately, is innately going to be racist but there's more pressure on Jeff Session that there is before because there's pressure on the Donald Trump's back. That's why he's doing things in order to cater to people of color. And then also number two, Jeff Session is going to automatically follow suit. And also number three, along to the SCOTUS argument that particularly talks about how laws are like different and he uses something from 1997 it's 2017 we've obviously seen a progression from uh, progression from like for instance people like uh, people that were gay they weren't a even able to like have uh, like marriage and stuff like that for instance like we was legalized in France it's like in Portland they're actually freeing the people that uh, that, that have a past conviction of marijuana convictions over there from over the course of 30 years this is empirical evidence about how law changes and about how you cannot post something from 1997 or from something from 1960 and automatically say that that's how history is going to be history 
history, evolution, it changes, which means that this plan is that first step to creating that change and creating that dialogue, which is the ethical question which I raise to you ultimately at the end of the day. Now, if all, uh, if all, uh, if all else, the framework innately still solves, because ultimately at the end of the day, that structural racism and about how we need to create uh, uh, experiences about the Hudson Weed 97 car, not about a Mimic 2000 car that he talks about, he talks about working for our unique experiences in the racially hostile world, my racially hostile world, the person of color's racially hostile world, this product actually increases the amount of transibility, uh, trans transparency and accountability that is held for officers that are out there on the streets for people like me. All right, let's go on to the all right, so first on T increase, number one, I mean less than 3% of police agencies report uh, use of force, and also the FBI sharply expanded the system so for tracking federal police shootings, get them a lot, but they don't plead on police encounters is notoriously difficult. The FBI can struggle to gather the most basic data, which means that that optional reporting that's in the status quo ultimately does not affect people of color or in relying on local police departments to voluntarily share information about officer involved shootings since 2011. Less than 3% of the nation's 18,000 state and local, local police agencies have done so. That means that ultimately at the end of the day, we're actually making an increase of what's going on within the status quo by making it an incentivized program that is going to ethically cause these police departments to do so because in the event when a police officer is actually doing something racist, they want to cover their asses and fire that police officer and show that they're not a bad police department agency, which means that we are within the realms of the top. Number two is the counter definition. Uh, 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 increase actually means one third of the total. This is maybe 2007. Well, actually, substantial is defined as one third of total. Now, number three, I meet my counter different man. Uh, I meet my counter definition plan. Man needs federal reporting in a hundred percent of police departments of every officer. That means that one third of the increases of what has already been implemented. And even if you don't buy that definition, you can go ahead and vote affirmative here because I and the status quo reporting is optional, which means that that regulation and increase that we're doing is making it mandatory. That mandatory is meaning that you have to do something in the status quo that's that's literally optional from what's happening. So still under that definition, I meet. And number four, let's go on to the counter standards. Number one is the Bright line. The definition that establishes a clear bright line should be preferred because of events, vague debates. You can vote after this because of the issue, because I need my counter definition clarifies how many departments actually release the data on the use of force. And then also, number two, which should be the biggest reason over here is reasonability. The negative must prove the shell holistically to win. No interpretation of my reasonability is that if I win one standard or counter standard, I mean, or counter definition, you will not vote the affirmative down. And still, ultimately, at the end of the day, if you not vote for any other arguments, my case still outweighs because the DA does not involve lives of people of color. You should highlight the credit for a T card. This is critically key here.
three kids here. Yeah. Seven yeah. minutes, seven minutes, and we are done. How about the two hours or is that six minutes? <laughs> it can be if we wanted to. <laughs> debate is debatable, folks. All right, third is going to be T, and we're going to be going on to case, and we're going to be going on to the disadvantage. Are you ready? No new cards? No new cards. Okay. The first argument to be extended across the weenie on the topicality. There was no reverse voting issue, and you're never going to be voting on behalf of the affirmative on the topicality. We make the argument that this is always going to be a necessary tool for the negative to check for the abuse of the affirmative. There's never going to be a voter on behalf of the affirmative on the topicality. Let's go ahead and get onto case. They say that they do the most amount of good for the most amount of people, but this is simply not true. The point they functionally concede the disadvantage, and they functionally concede all the no solvency arguments on case. They say that solvency is guarded through the ethics, not through the monetary policy. We say that Sessions does not care about ethics. There's not going to be any pressure to F and support sessions to actually enact a policy tax to create these grants in a sufficient amount so that the individual, state, and local uh, precincts are going to want to participate in this program. Specifically, referencing the Read in 17 evidence on how he does not care. Not to mention that his base, the people that he actually cares about, are going to be seeing him as a hero by not passing the plan and by continuing to delay it because that's just what these people want. He doesn't care about the people as a whole, he only cares about his individual base. They try to extend across the current 14 evidence. They say that the negative doesn't do anything to change. The mindset. We don't have to prove that. That is not our burden. We simply have to prove that you do not make the mindset better. Not only that, but we also prove that you make the mindset worse. Next, they say that the FBI does not have any grant program and therefore that they still have inherency. But no, let me read you the grant and 15 evidence. The new bill and the old law share two salient features. They rely on states to provide the information needed and they use federal grants as the mechanism for compliance. The private act creates grants relying on care to achieve its aim. Literally, the old FBI law and the new grant, and through the grant and 15 evidence, we see that the private act relies on the same mechanism. Like, Literally, this is the same thing, just done over. This is also going to be the fact that they conceded the masking turn on the advantage one. This is probably going to be meaning that they're never going to be able to have any access to, one, their framework, or two, their impacts. Next, they said that the SCOTUS in 97 evidence is old, but they completely conceded the TARM in 17 evidence that just says the same thing, but like from last year. This is just how the status quo. This is how it is. This form of enforcing through the DOJ is unconstitutional, which means that this is going to be the link into the disadvantage. On to the disadvantage. They say that plan is the first step, and the only rationale that they give for that is that they say that nowhere in the plan does it highlight people of color. Then the disadvantage, sorry. The disadvantage as a whole is literally on how rescinding this, this, this decision by the Supreme Court is going to be hurting people of color. Latinos are people of color. By allowing state and local, um, and the local, state and local police to enforce immigration law, you're going to be uniquely discriminating against them. They completely concede the impact level of card on how that simply institutionalizes the racism that we already see within the police system. It's going to be not only government sponsored, but government mandated. They completely concede all the evidence and the link, the internal link. This is going to be where you vote. At the point where they're simply going to be reentrenching the institution racism, the very same arguments that they're trying to solve back for, they don't flow through their own framework, they don't have access to any of their impacts, and they simply make it worse. Right now, their solvency mechanism, or their enforcement mechanism, should I say, is deemed unconstitutional. You cannot attach these grants in return for favors. The Department of Justice was banned from doing that by the Chicago court. Now, what's going to be happening is if you pass the plan, that's either one, double bind, you're going to be not solving because it's just going to be get, getting repealed, or two, you're going to be setting a precedent that the, that the Department of Justice can attach these grants to mandates, in which case then you're going to be allowing Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions to force state and local enforcement of immigration law. They completely concede that that's what they're trying to do right now in the status quo. If their plan does manage to pass, it's going to be like that. They have the power to do it now, which means that they're going to be, well, doing it. They're going to be forcing state and local police to enforce immigration law. And the point is they completely concede how this is going to be uniquely re-entrenching this racist mindset within the police. We have clearly proven that the affirmative not only does not solve the mindset, but they make it worse. Onto the framework, they say that they still solve. Their only argument is, again, that we don't spotlight the suffering of people of color. But at the point which not only do we spotlight it through the disadvantage, but we prove that the affirmative makes it worse. That we may, that they make the world of our people of color more hostile because they're simply going to be giving the Department of Justice under Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions, two people who quite frankly don't care about reforming the police one bit, more power. 
to completely and utterly direct state and local agenda on how they're going to be functioning. Well, that's all that the affirmative plan is going to be able to do. At the point which we've already had the plan action. With the grant policy, they have no inherency. Or at the very least, it's going to be functioning as solvency mitigation because we can prove that it's technically still optional. Because if these the programs, if these uh, pre precincts don't want these grants, they can simply choose to not opt into the program. The only problem is that they don't receive the grants. It's mandatory if you want the grants. If you reject the grants, then you don't have to do anything. We made the argument that problematic police departments are simply going to opt to not receive the grants, which means that you're still not going to be able to solve. No matter how you look at it, Lincoln Douglas is the stock issues debate format. We have inherency. We won that at the point which we already had this program in the status quo. We have solvency at the point which this proves that their solvency isn't going to be able to function because Jeff Sessions isn't going to be creating these grants or they're going to be setting it at the bar so low that no program is going to want to participate. They completely concede that Jeff Sessions does not care about the people as a whole. He only cares about his cohorts and his base, which is going to be seeing him as a hero for delaying the policy action, which is that they don't have solvency. They don't have inherent, they don't have solvency, and we're going to be completely outweighing on the conceded disadvantage on how you're going to be making the mindset, specifically on the local and state level for the police, worse, because you're going to be institutionalizing this racism. Not just is it going to be happening like in the general area, it's going to be encouraged and mandated by the federal government. At the end of the day, we can clearly see that the affirmative is not a good idea. On a net beneficial scale or on the stock issues paradigm, you're going to be voting on behalf of the negation. No prep time for you, boy, okay? No prep time for you, boy. So in case the you're doing a nice little overview over on case. And yep. We're gonna follow right after that. Oh, you're so kind, you're so kind. Um alright. So So first off, with the reason why you're going to be voting for the affirmative is because, like I said before, we create a good amount of change for the best amount of people. Listen, everything in the world comes with a cost. When you drink too much, you get a blackout. Or, or when you drink too much, you get a blackout. When you eat too much, you get a food coma. Basically, essentially, all these things ultimately come at a cost. Because of the transparency that we should have for the police department, if that comes, at, even at a little bit of a risk at a cost for police, uh, for incentive, uh, or in, like little, like, for insinuous means for the Justice Department to do certain different types of things. We can hold them accountable. Let's not forget about how we vote these people in every four years. The power of your voice ultimately comes into this play where you ultimately have the ability to actually control the amount of things that you want within the status quo. The, the war that my opponent is defending is the war of the status quo, ultimately saying that the police are innately or the government innately is going to do something that is in cities. When has the government done the best amount of good for the best amount of people? I'm never going to sit here and tell you that I'm going to defend every instance that the United States federal government is good. I'm going to defend the instance that what this act does is innately good because, like I said before, the current 14 card, which talks about how the a mindset about how people look at uh, 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 POCs, I can't hate black people, aka Hispanics, anybody that the police sees as somebody that is not white, those things are actually documented within, or that are not documented within the status quo. We want to hold these police officers accountable. That is literally the one you see, even if that comes to the cost of low, uh, of low, uh, of low trench benefits. When a police officer shoots another person, you, you're going to want to think that the police department is going to want to cover their asses. That's an argument that I said before, ultimately, which talks about how police departments are ultimately going to want to do this out of an ethical advantage because they want to be seen as somebody that you want to serve, protect, not serve and shoot. And those are governments, uh, and th that is literally the reason why you're going to be voting for the affirmative. Now, the second reason is because of the framework that talks about the racially hostile world that we you know, that we live in, ultimately, at the end of the day. Now, the arguments that he went for initially is talking about how the harms are essentially happening within the status quo. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the FBI and the Department of Justice are two totally different things. That was uncontested, which means that when we pass this into law, that law will actually encourage people and incentivize people in order to get into these programs. And those grants are literally a net better world for anybody it's, uh, or everybody, especially for the affirmative for people of color in those communities. Now, the argument that I'm going to leave you with here is the battle of structural violence. We do not increase any particular elements of structural violence. And, like I said before, the war that my neck, that my partner over here is defending, or homie, homie over here is defending, is the status quo. So either you want to have a war where at least somebody gets saved, or at least somebody can go and report to the, uh, the police department and actually sue the person that shot an unarmed black individual or individual that was detained in the custody, or you can leave yourself within the status quo and have those more further violent instances and more than more of those violent, uh, more
ignore those violent things that are happening in the status quo. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we do the best amount of good for the best amount of people. Everything comes at a cost. This plan ultimately does come at a cost, but the amount of good that it does ultimately benefits the people that are in these situations. So for all of these reasons, you still have the ultimate urge for you to vote affirmative because ultimately, at the end of the day, the lives of people of color, the lives of black people are ultimately at stake, no matter if it's about probability or no matter if it's about, about how much money that we're going to get. A person's life is essentially the most critical value, and that is the act. So that means that you automatically vote for the affirmative. Four, five, five, five.